welcome everybody uh, sit down or um, stay at the bar and buy your beer in silence <laughs> so uh, the title of this um, event is um, the state of the world and the cooperation within it uh, that in Norwegian the title is uh, much, much simpler than that. <laughs> it's just um, who has got most power in the world today? <laughs> and um, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we suspect that the corporations will, uh, will turn up in, in this discussion, uh, especially since we have got Joel Bacan, <laughs> I vote right, uh, to, to talk to us about, about this team. And uh, Joel, he is a um, professor in, in law at the University of British Columbia, Canada. And some of you will remember him, many of you maybe, uh, as the man behind the corporation, the 2004 film and book, where Joel investigates the evolution and the power of the modern corporation and where he ends up um, diagnosing the corporation uh, as a psychopath. And uh, so, Joel, uh, come up here. The floor is here. And tell us about who's got most okay, power okay, in the world okay. today. Okay. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. This is a, uh, a really interesting conference. It's the first one I've been at that combines comedy with economics, um, <laughs> which strikes me as an unusual combination because I've always thought economics was really funny anyways. Um, <laughs> the various assumptions that are made and, and you know that we're rational actors and all these sorts of things never made any sense to me. So finally, somebody had the insight that this is high humor. This is surreal and bizarre. Let's have a conference. So here we are. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned... <laughs> thank you. As was mentioned, in 2004, I released a book and film called The Corporation. And in it, I basically asked, uh, if the corporation is a person, which our legal systems say it is, it's a legal person, an artificial person, then what kind of person is it? Um, my punchline was already given away. I argued that publicly traded corporations are psychopathic institutions. And this wasn't just a, a kind of over the top you know, insult. Um, it was based on a very fine tuned analysis. I am a legal scholar after all. I do fine tuned analyses, and um, <laughs> unlike economists. And so, um, so the analysis basically said that what the law of the corporation says is that a corporation always has to put its shareholders' interests above all others, it has to be self interested. And that if it's a person and it has to be self-interested, well, if we took a human being and said, this human being is incapable of caring about any others, only caring about himself or herself, then we would have somebody named Donald Trump. No, I meant to say, <laughs> sorry. I meant to say, then we would have somebody that we would diagnose as a psychopath. Um, <laughs> well, maybe those two things are related. Um, so, a few years after the film came out, and I'd be going around screening it and talking about it, it's actually playing right now across town somewhere, um, but a few years after, around 2006, people started coming up to me and saying, you know what, you were right. The corporation was a psychopath, but it isn't anymore. Your argument no longer holds, because corporations may have been psychopaths back then, but they've changed. They've been cured of their psychopathy, or at least they're in treatment, and the treatment's going <laughs> fairly well. Now they truly care about society and the environment. They don't only care about their own financial self-interest. Now, as Unilever CEO Paul Pullman recently described it, and honestly, I have to take my word for this, every CEO has said something like this. Now, quote, our fiduciary duty is no longer to put shareholders first. 
We focus our company on improving the lives of the world's citizens and come up with genuine sustainable solutions. When I was making the film, we had corporate social responsibility, but it was always seen as being this kind of peripheral thing, even within the corporate community. You know, you throw a few dollars this way, you have a nice program over here. What's really changed now is that corporations are saying that's at the core of what they do is being good, being sustainable, being socially responsible. It's a new kind of corporation. It's kind of like you may remember back in the 1980s, the new man. Remember the new man? Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember how that turned out? Um, not so great. I mean, let's face it, we men, and I take responsibility here, we didn't really change that much. I mean, you know, maybe we took out the garbage when we weren't told to, or we cooked a few meals and burned them or whatever, but fundamentally we stayed the same, and the complaint stayed the same. You can talk to my wife about that. Um, and I really think it's the same with corporations that they may seem better on the surface, they may take out the garbage more often or do some laundry, but they haven't really changed, not fundamentally. Their overarching mission and mandate is the same, to pursue financial self-interest in the form of profit, shareholder value, and growth. That, uh, what's new is that they now say they can do those things alongside and through promoting social and environmental goods. That, that, that that's not just on the periphery anymore, but that's how they're going to make money. That social and environmental goods can be profitable, and they should make profitable profit off of them. And so this is kind of the new ethos you hear when you talk to uh, people in top management in companies. And it goes by different names. Shared value is a name uh, that uh, Michael Porter at Harvard has come up with that idea, the idea you share value between your own self-interest and social interest. Conscious capitalism. Creative capitalism, that's Bill Gates' idea. Connected capitalism, that's Lord John Brown's idea. Inclusive capitalism, that's uh, Paul Pullman's idea from Unilever. Sustainable capitalism, win-win capitalism. All of these say, basically, they come down to the same thing, that corporations can and should do well, even better than they used to, by doing good. Do well by doing good. That's the basic ethos. We can have it all. We can save the world and make lots of money while we're doing it. That's what corporations today are saying, fundamentally. And it works. It works sometimes. There is some overlap between making money and doing good in the world. And I think of the, and I should have brought it along, I meant to, but then I forgot. But there's this little card in my hotel room, and it asked me to save the planet by reusing my towel. <laughs> Um, don't throw it on the floor, but, you know, use it for the whole four days you're going to be here. Um, that's good for the environment, and it's good for the best Western hotel chain that owns my hotel because they can cut down on their laundry costs. So it, it, it's a win-win scenario. Uh, Unilever. Unilever goes to Bangladesh and trains rural women how to be beauticians. And that's great because it provides them jobs that they wouldn't otherwise have. It helps them get out of poverty. And it also provides an entire new market for Unilever's beauty products, like Dove and those kind of things. So again, it's win-win. And there are many examples of this, of these kind of win-win logics. And you know, they're great as, as far as they go. But really the question is, the fundamental question is, how far do they go? Because to listen to the new corporation CEOs and the gurus and the commentators that cheer them on, you think there's almost a perfect convergence between doing good and doing well. That's what they want us to believe, that we're entering a post-conflict, and Marx would roll over in his grave, right? We're entering a post-conflict capitalism where profit, social, and environmental goods all perfectly align. The, the triple bottom line is another term that's used to describe this. That's what they want us to believe. But it's ridiculous. It's absurd. It's nonsense up on stilts. There's plenty of conflict, and indeed there's mainly conflict between profit, social, and the environment to begin with. 
If doing well is the corporation's fundamental imperative, which everybody agrees it is, then doing bad is highly likely when it, rather than doing good, will be the best way to do well. Okay, I know that's a lot, but just run it through your head. It, <laughs> it works. And it explains why companies that pride themselves and are widely regarded as the good guys, the good corporations, keep doing such bad things. Like British Petroleum was the sort of icon of, of sustainable, of environmental, and look what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, platform in the Gulf of Mexico. The Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh, which implicated companies like Walmart, H&M, The Gap, all purporting to be sustainable companies. Volkswagen regularly voted one of the most sustainable, good, you know, wonderful companies in the world, and then there's this sweeping and scandalous cheating. Johnson & Johnson, another company that says its fundamental mission is to help people, not to make money. Um, but then it engages in fraudulent and unlawful marketing of drugs that kills people. Um, so, so that's the first problem, is that companies are still going to do bad if that enables them to do well, uh, more so than doing good. And the imperative to do well also explains why corporations that claim to be sustainable and socially responsible chronically deploy business models that are anything but. So, uh, Honeywell. Honeywell is, has probably the most sustainable factory in the world, in Kansas City. It's won all kinds of awards. It's like Leeds quadruple certified. It's, it's, it's just everybody says this is the model of how not to create waste, how not to use too much water, and all these other things. What does that plant make? Nuclear weapons! <laughs> Give me a break! This is high comedy, I'm telling you. So, so look it up, I'm not, I'm not lying. The, the Kansas City plant of Honeywell, super, super sustainable, model for everybody. It makes nuclear weapons. Um, American British Tobacco. American British Tobacco will take you, and, and uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute, but I'm making a sequel to the corporation film. I'm in the middle of production as we speak, um, and we're gonna actually do this. We are, we are going to go on a tour led by somebody from American British Tobacco to show us how biodiverse their tobacco fields are. Isn't that wonderful? The tobacco company is promoting biodiversity. They're making cigarettes. <laughs> I, I mean, what's socially responsible about that? All right, but so those are the bad guys. What about Coca-Cola? It wins sustainability awards for using renewable and recyclable plant-based plastics to make bottled water, arguably, according to Luke Upchurch of Consumers International, the exact antithesis of what sustainability means. So you've got the bottled water, very unsustainable, but the bottle is sustainable because it's made out of plant-based protein. And, and then, then there are the major oil companies who, you know, isn't the Paris Accord great? We love the Paris Accord. Oh, Donald Trump, he's such a bad man for withdrawing from the Paris Accord. But do you really think they'd be cheering the Accord as enthusiastically as they do if they hadn't succeeded in gutting it of any meaningful enforcement mechanisms, of any meaningful standards to the point where it places virtually no restrictions on their ability to keep doing what they do, which is fossil fuel drilling, fracking, pipeline building, and so on. So, uh, to wrap up, no doubt corporations talk a new talk. No doubt they, to some extent, walk a new walk. But when you peel back the positive and happy personas, the smiling faces, even just a little bit, what you find is the new corporation is really not that different than the old one, just like the new man. Uh, they remain driven by unbridled self-interest, psychopathic self-interest, though now with this kind of benevolent twist. So, you know, you, you've all heard of the charm of the psychopath. That's what's happening. The psychopath has become more charming, and as a result, in my view, more dangerous. More dangerous because now corporations are leveraging their new charm to seduce societies and governments to do basically two things. One, hand them more authority over public goods traditionally delivered by governments, privatization by another name, schools, water systems, prisons, other public goods, 
Now corporations are involved in those much more. And second, freeing them from mandatory legal regulations and believing that because they're good guys now, they can regulate themselves. The second point is connected to another area I'm interested in, namely the deregulatory thrust of international investment protect protection agreements, uh, ones that grant corporations rights to sue countries directly for often billions of dollars for regulating them. But that's a topic of my co-panelist, Jan Eric. Uh, and so I will stop here and hand the stage over to him. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janne, you already got uh, an introduction. Uh, Jan uh, Erik Grinheim, you're working as an analyst in Civita. Uh, it's a Norwegian uh, think tank. And there where you work with uh, international trade and we yes. want to hear your take, what's the state of the world and what about the cooperation within it? Well, I, I disagree with you uh, <laughs> because I believe in capitalism. <laughs> so, uh, Perfect. Although we both play jazz, uh, <laughs> we disagree on this because I think capitalism has given us a much better life uh, than, uh, than we uh, would have had without it. And I think uh, big corporations, of course, you can find a lot of corporations doing a lot of bad things. But the examples you mentioned, I, I think the nuclear weapon, that's a really good one. But the other ones are more like things happen. There are risks um, when you do um, production of things, when you sell things and so on. Uh, and we have to minimize those risks. But you can never have a risk-free world. That's um, my argument. And, and what's the alternative? What's the alternative of big corporations? I, I agree with you that they have a lot of power. And if you look at the 100 biggest economies today, 69 of them are big corporations. Now, on top, you have countries. But when you say that it's bad with privatization and it's bad that you have big corporations, what's the alternative? That's my question. Is, is a, is a big state much better? Is public uh, schooling much better? Yes, I would argue it is. But you can also say that private uh, corporations can provide public services. Uh, it's not deregulation, it's re-regulation we talk about. And you can perfectly well see huge corporations doing a good job also providing public services. That's a question of competition. And the responsibility can still be with the state, but the production of of the services can be with uh, with uh, international corporations or small and medium-sized uh, companies. And you, you um, pointed at um, this um, arbitration um, institutions at, at the end of your presentation. One of the problems we have been discussing when we look at international trade agreements is how do you solve um, conflicts between uh, corporations and states or municipalities? Uh, well, we have over the last 20 years, but since the 1960s, really, we have got what we call uh, Investor State Dispute Settlements, ISDS, in Investor State Dispute Settlements, um, arbitration um, legal bodies, uh, set up in each case for each uh, agreement um, to handle problems where a corporation, as you say, will sue the state or the municipality. But you shouldn't forget that these um, agreements that we have uh, for investments and trade and so on. Um, they're also set up by the states. And in fact, the ISDS institution as such um, was invented by the states who wanted to do this. And in, in the United States, for instance, uh, you have only had 50 cases uh, of this kind between big corporations and um, the state or the states of the United States. And um, only 13 of them were won by the corporations. The rest were either solved in some kind of agreement or uh, won by the states. There are 3,000, a, a bit more than 3,000 international agreements today with ISDS institutions. And there are uh, 800, a little bit more than 800 cases that has been running, and a bit more than 500 of them have been solved. 36% in favor of the state, only 26 in favor of the companies, of the big corporation. And in fact, not only big corporations, 50% of those have been small and medium-sized enterprises. So I think it's a myth, it's, it's a huge myth that uh, these uh, international um, investor state dispute settlements, the arbitration uh, institutions, are in the hands of the big corporations. On the contrary, we see that most countries, when they go into agreements, uh, they want to have these institutions as part of the international agreements. 
So that's one of the myths. The, and the other one is that, uh, that the world is growing worse. Um, I, I agree, I'm not, I'm not particularly fond of, of corporate social responsibility. I think a good company should be sustainable when it comes to economics. It should run a profit, so we have shareholders uh, share, and also you have um, a place to work. We shouldn't forget that this is companies which provide people with a job. And, and I think uh, if you look at Norway, two-thirds of the jobs in Norway are by private companies. This, this city has been built on oil revenues and private companies and private capital. So I, I totally disagree with most of what you say. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is good. Then we'll have a debate <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but first we hear Josef Noll. And you are from um, the Department of Technology Systems at the University of Oslo. But here you're going to talk about the social responsibility of the corporations. Yes, and uh, I, I like the intro. The intro was all only about European or international companies. And then we look at uh, our Norwegian companies, and we see that uh, Telenor had a wonderful product. They made a SIM card, a secondary SIM card, which they gave to women, so that women would get a phone. And then they told the story to our dear royal crown prince, and uh, he published it on one investor day, on corporate social respon on responsibility works. Unfortunately, the whole story only lasted for six months. Then Tilnor found out that the revenue wasn't big enough, so they stopped this program of getting SIM cards to, to women. We have the second one, this really blow up of, uh, you know, of co-op, where uh, co uh, the leader of co-op signed this agreement, no more sugar to the children, or whatever. And then they started this price war on, on sweeties. So it is really about uh, talking one thing and doing another thing. And actually, I worked for eight years for Tilnor. I was part of the team developing 3G, and we said, always online, always connected. That was the slogan when 3G came up. And it never happened. At the end, it was the EU Commission which had to force the operators, and there comes the story of forcing and enforcing, which had to force the operators to actually say, free roaming in Europe. And I go one step longer and say that, why don't I have transparency in terms of free access to information everywhere. I don't, need, uh, I don't need a password, I don't need whatever. I can walk out on the, on the road and I want to walk on the internet. That, and that transparency actually, I think, is the key to get understanding of what is going on in both these trade agreements where I couldn't disagree more with you, seeing that what kind of trade agreements are happening with Africa. Because these, uh, why these African countries can't come up? The reason here is simply that they get the agreements on forehand saying that, you know, keep quiet. You have to get our chicken wings and our milk powder from Europe and the US, which is so cheap that at the end it ruins your own economy. So that we have poverty in Africa is not only the result of that they can't handle an economy, that they are corrupt, that they only make war. It's also a result of that we heavily subsidize our things on top and bring them out. And that was, the, uh, for me, the reason that at the end of the day, some years at university, I said, no, we need to change. So we built the Basic Internet Foundation for actually bringing access to information to Africa. Because I think the story of digitization will come. We have to support it, though I'm not out after, uh, after any more problems, but I want to start in the very beginning, which is the free access to information. And I think by that we can invite for a discussion, right? Well, it's a uh, chair. Yeah, yeah. I store everything. Okay. <laughs> mm. Last man standing. Last man standing. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Okay. okay. It's been a long day. Uh, long festival, I like to say it. Uh, good, but you have to start answering this, Joel. Uh, is this 
the state of the world real, when it comes to the power of the corporations really as bad as you describe it? Well, I find Jan's argument interesting because, uh, you know, when I go back and read Adam Smith, mm -hmm. for example, um, he was a big proponent of capitalism, um, but he reviled corporations. Uh, he believed that the structure of them, the separation of ownership from management, would lead to, and I'm quoting him, negligence and profusion, close quote. So I guess what I would say to Jan is, can't we imagine a system, a market-based system, that doesn't allow for the immense concentration of power in companies that then is so immense that it enables them to actually influence governments, influence politics, uh, influence our values and, and our lives in very deep ways. In other words, is it all or nothing? Um, so my argument would, would be to you, wouldn't be let's get rid of capitalism, let's get rid of corporations. It would be let's get rid of this idea that markets and corporations should be the whole show and that there's no longer a place for public democratic bodies in the mix. And I think you yourself said, well, you know, public schools are probably better delivered by government. You know, one of the stories I'm doing in my new film is a company out of Silicon Valley backed by Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg that has convinced several um, uh, African governments that uh, their best bet is to have a for-profit company uh, bring schools to their children, and it's, it's an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my feeling is a corporation's like a lawnmower. Um, if you take it and you mow your lawn, it will do a really good job. If you try to vacuum your living room carpet with it, it won't. And, and so, so I'm, I guess what I would say to Jan is, is your position that corporations should do everything, that there should be no limits, that self-regulation should completely re replace regulation? And if that's not your position, if there's some kind of balance, then I think we're not really as much at odds as you think. I have some con some yeah. responses to your ISDS <laughs> argument as well. Yeah, but but where like we, we start to have. Yes. Uh, what, what I, I, I said it's not deregulation, it's re-regulation. And I'm not saying that we are uh, letting them off the leash. I think we should regulate capitalism. Uh, I think that's the success of capitalism when it's regulated. And you have in the United States, for instance, as they try to copy in Europe, antitrust uh, legislation, and you try to regulate uh, the market so we do not have oligopoles or monopoles. So th that's, uh, I think, um, I didn't say that I'm not regulating capitalism. Yes, but, but could we just clear up here? All right, you should regulate capitalism, but should we regulate it more or less than today? Well, I think uh, it, we see it clearly in the European Union that they try to regulate it more because mm. some actors have too much power. And so that's more. good. <laughs> yes, I think mm. we should have yeah. competition. Competition is good. Mm. I actually would like to extend mm. on that because I, I, I really see hope. And the hope comes from those whom I actually didn't expect it, from our politicians. Because at the end of the day, mm. all the nations have signed up for the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. And this uh, 17 main goals with 169 indicators is really for the first time that we tried to put measurable indicators on how we want the world to develop. And, and that is really, for me, one of the steps that I hear if Till Noor talks about their partnership for the goals. I really would like to see which goals are they addressing, what is the baseline, and what are they going to achieve, so that it's not going to be just talk, but that it's really provable evidence of that they are contributing to that what they say they're contributing. You wanted to comment? No, I wanted to comment on... on uh, because I, the reason why I'm strongly mm. in favor of, of uh, international agreements like the TTIP, the Trans-Atlantic um, uh, Trade and Investment Partnership and things like that, is that you, you produce things in a totally different way today than you did 50 years ago. For instance, Siemens, um, the electro company, they have, company, they have uh, offices in mm. 192 countries. As you say in your film, too, there are companies from well, all over the world and that, that you have to regulate this in one system. That, that's why so, I'm in yeah, favor of this. So, I mean, so I, I guess I have two problems mm. with, the, with the ISDS system. 
The first is that it doesn't seem to be doing what it originally was designed to do. What it was originally designed to do is protect a company like Siemens from arbitrary uh, expropriation kinds of behavior on the part of a state that it's invested in. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of problem with that. But one of the problems is that the relevant clauses, words like discrimination, I'm saying this as a lawyer now, have been blown out in their interpretations to include things like Philip Morris suing the nation of Uruguay for imposing uh, plain package requirements on its cigarettes. Now, it's true that Philip Morris lost that case, but it's also true that they wouldn't have even been able to fight the case. They would have had to capitulate to, to that lawsuit if Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire former mayor of New York, didn't pay their legal bills. And this is the kind of invisible piece that we don't normally see in, the, uh, in these ISDS international trade agreements. And that is that a company can basically uh, harass a country, can threaten a lawsuit, and, the, and can threaten a lawsuit, and in their statement of claim, it will be for billions of dollars of losses as a result of some kind of environmental or social regulation. At that point, a poor country like Uruguay or Colombia or Ecuador or South Africa or other countries that are targeted in this way really has no choice but to put immense amounts of resources into fighting the case or to back off. And they do both. But more often, they back off. And so it's, you mentioned that the governments usually win these awards, but what you're not talking about is what's happening in the subterfuge. And what's happening is these, these kinds of cases are used as threats, and countries basically will back off, they'll change the regulation, they'll avoid the regulation, or they won't even regulate in the first place out of fear that they're gonna be subject to one of these lawsuits partly because the uh, laws have been interpreted so broadly in their favor, and partly because the arbitration system itself, by many analysts' accounts, is unfair. And there are all kinds of reasons why. You have the same people sitting as judges who also represent companies in the proceedings. There are all kinds of flaws that have led to calls to create an actual court of, in, of arbitration, which you may agree with, I don't know, but the, the problem is that the arbitrations are biased and unfair uh, because of the system through which they're run. I disagree, but that... Yeah, I disagree, <laughs> but uh, you, <laughs> you, give, you give up there. Okay, uh, you want to say... Uh, something yeah, to maybe, we, maybe we, we can change the topic because we had somewhere in the agenda we had also the topic of uh, social control. Mm -hmm. And for me today, mm -hmm. like... Whatever app you install, not on my beautiful mm. Sailfish or S phone, which nobody else except me has. Oh. Uh, <laughs> whenever you read this app uh, stories, you 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 may open. It's the the old Nokia guys <laughs> who who said that we are not uh, uh, in one of these American tunes. Anyway, whenever you install an app, you have to like click 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 click, and it's like the same as discussing with uh, with my wife. At the end, I have to say I agree. <laughs> right? And, and, and that is how it currently is. There is no way of whatsoever that we have any type of transparency of what is actually happening. Why do I have to agree that Facebook actually can read my phone and can analyze my voice? That's what I agree on if I install Facebook, which basically needs, uh, means that if I talk on the phone, I have given them the legal rights to actually tap into my phone call, analyze the words, and then suggest what kind of friends I should have or not have. You know, that is the very extreme. And that is the Trump uh, transparency which we are missing and where I really think that that should be the re-regulation, Jan, which uh, you would like to bring up. Well, I'm not on Facebook, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have this... Uh, well, <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think it's a big problem. And this is one of the problems, the new big companies. They are uh, controlling our lives in a very different way from what they did before, and uh, Apple, Google, and so on. And this is a real challenge. I totally agree. Yes, can we keep there a little bit? Uh, because before we had like a big oil and big finance, and now we have big, big tech. Um, uh, do you think, uh, Joel, that uh, that this new 
technology corporations uh, like Facebook and Google and Apple and Microsoft, do they um, exercise their power in, in different ways than, than the old ones, or is it just... Well, I think they're mm. very, mm. I think for all the reasons that uh, we've been discussing, they're, they're a great concern and they're increasingly moving into mm. um, many domains that are within the traditional economy. For example, Amazon is moving into grocery mm. retail. And, and so the, the business model that they bring um, is increasingly going to be affecting more and more areas. And I think that business model is not ideologically neutral uh, when you look at the, the thinking in Silicon Valley. And I'm not going to say it's, it's like Jan Eriks because that would be too cheap a shot because mm -hmm. he's much more subtle in his thinking. But there's, I, I don't know if you know the philosopher Anne Rand. Um, <laughs> So, so there, is a, there is a mentality in Silicon Valley that I think percolates through the business models of these businesses that is very libertarian uh, and uh, very uncritical of immense concentrations of wealth in particular companies. And when you combine that with uh, what uh, Yosef was just talking about, their access to and their use of, of our information. Um, and, and it's not like we can easily opt out uh, because we become ourselves tied in to these social networks. But, but the data mining that goes on and the use of that data, I think is a very, very dangerous thing, a very threatening thing. Yeah, I, everybody uh, say yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, I can add on one. You know, we had this discussion on privacy labeling before, and I, I actually think that uh, wherever we are able to put uh, clarity on whatever products and services, it will help the consumers at the end of this, uh, the day to see what they are buying. And for me, what I would like is actually having a privacy label saying that, well, this phone. I, I am sure it's my folks from Nokia, and they, are, they said that they will leave the data on the phone, and they will not share it with any of the other folks. And that, for me, then, would be a privacy label A, perhaps. Th thus, uh, what I'm more out after is what are the solutions? Because at the end of the day, I worked all my life in industry. I think I know how Telenor and these folks think, but I also know that they are pressed by their shareholder value. But I, yeah. I think one of the problems with your arguments is that you, you, you look beyond the politicians. It, it's like we, we live in a democracy, and in a democracy you will not accept big corporations to run your life. It's a big problem with this new corporations because mm. they have a control that we are not really uh, able mm. to, to regulate in, in a good political way. But what, what I think is that if you look at, at modern societies, liberal democracies like United States, Canada and so on, they are very well-developed when it comes to public services. Extremely well-developed. Even the United States use at just as much per, per capita on public health as we do in Norway. So, so it's not like, like corporations run the world. On the contrary, I think the world is run by politicians very much. Well, I, I mean, I think there's one thing that needs to be added to that, and that's corporations are created by governments and by states. And so, so I agree, it's not, in my view, it's not that useful to say, oh, we have government here mm -hmm. and we have corporation here. I think what's useful is to say, how is government using the monopoly of power that it has over us? Is it helping out this creature that it's created, corporations, or is it helping people by protecting their environment or protecting their social goods? And so I, I, I do agree with you that to try to, that, that it is states and state power that have a lot of uh, the coercive power in the world. At the same time, corporations, which are created by states, are able to then refract back onto those states and create a lot of influence. And maybe that doesn't happen as much in Norway, but certainly in Canada and the United States, um, that is a, a fundamental issue. I'd, I'd like to jump on with, with one uh, statement here, and that is the statement of what I see what is happening in Africa. Because at the end of the day, China managed by closing their internet walls to build up Alibaba. Now I see that Alibaba is running uh, Wi-Fi hotspots in India, 
and that a lot of Chinese companies who, buy, amongst others, bought Opera software and now say that Opera software is our entry to the African market. And then I look at our politicians and I sometimes feel they are blind. They don't see what is going on in terms of bringing whatever you can out of Africa. And then when Africa grows to more than 2 billion people and they don't have sustainable work, they are not on the digital train. They don't have an economy which works. I mean, does anyone think that these people will emigrate to China? And I don't, I don't know why our government, sorry, you are in the think tank of the government. <laughs> so why is that not obvious that if we want to have values, then we need to uh, in, invest in the infrastructure for actually digital economies, for participation, for partnership? But don't we do that? No. <laughs> do we do enough of it? Uh, well, I think if you, if you let companies do it, like we, we build up this country with the for foreign capital, German, French, British capital, so why shouldn't other countries have the same path to development as we have had? But uh, then we also, when we built our, our oil industry, for example, sure, we had a lot of regulations, happen. a lot of conditions, uh, for example, technology transfer for the foreign companies to, to come in. Thus, uh, countries in Africa have the same um, abilities today to do to do. Well, I think well, they can if they have good political systems, mm. good institutions, good bureaucracies, and good rule of law, etc., etc. Then they wouldn't be poor, maybe? No. <laughs> Probably not. Should we get questions? Yes, we should um, open from... There were, yes? Uh, uh, I wonder why mm. it was framed in the oil industry as having Um, because, because, Why? yeah. So, sorry, that's fair. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the rec so so the oh. question oh, they, is. They want, how do you repeat? The, the question, question is that many state-owned com companies have accidents as well as for-profit private companies like British Petroleum, and so why don't I talk about the state-owned companies as well? Um, and I guess, you know, one easy answer to that, and I'll get to the more difficult answer, uh, the easy answer is that my focus is on the for-profit corporation. I mean, I can look at states, and I can say not only do their companies have accidents, but they act in authoritarian ways, they do terrible things. So I'm not necessarily saying that states are great. What I am saying is that my interest as a commercial lawyer is to look at this institution of the corporation and how its particular incentives lead to problems happening, namely its incentive system based upon its need to uh, always prioritize shareholders' interests and how that, in the BP case, uh, led, according to all kinds of blue-chip reports after, to cost-cutting measures, to safety infractions, to all kinds of problems that ultimately led to the explosion. Now, you could probably do a similar analysis in terms of the accident of a Chinese-owned state uh, oil company operating in my country, in Canada, in the Alberta tar sands. A huge accident causing people to die, causing oil spills and everything else. But your analysis would be different. Um, your, your analysis wouldn't be about the imperative of profit. It wouldn't be about shareholders, but it would probably be about corruption. It would probably be about various kinds of pressures that were being put on the company to generate money for state coffers. Um, so I'm not denying that that happens. I'm simply saying my particular area of expertise 
is commercial law, corporate law, and I'm interested in how it happens in these corporations. I don't think that obliges me to analyze every other context in which accidents happen. Jan Erik, you wanted to comment. Yes, yeah. I, I totally agree with you, but isn't there also <laughs> kind of shame and blame for, for big corporations that they have to be careful also? for the good uh, reputation, that's one thing. And then I had a former student who was for Statoil in Azerbaijan, and he said, Statoil has probably brought more democracy to Azerbaijan than any state policy from Norway, because we, uh, we want transparency, we have a no corruption policy, et cetera, et cetera. So huge corporations can also bring uh, rule of law, democracy, anti-corruption, and so on. Although I, I, I'm not saying they, they are the good guys all the time, of course not, but they can also do good. No, I think it's very complicated. If you, well, Statoil is a state-owned company, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it used to be, but now it's... Has it been... It's it privatized, but it's owned by the state, uh, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is state-owned, 60% here is state-owned. <laughs> Uh, my, my comment here would be that uh, though I know that we have the big companies, I still see that when it comes to transparency or when it comes to security, my main job at university is professor for wireless communication and security. And what I see is it's mainly security by obscurity. You don't have a proven security model. You don't have an open security model often. And that is the same when it comes to transparency. So that is actually my my point where I want to jump in. And there are initiatives when we talk about corporations. I, I think immediately about wemove.eu, where like more than 900,000 people have signed up to actually look and go out after Monsanto and uh, uh, what's this, Glufo, whatever, you know what I'm talking about, Roundup. Uh, so, so there are movements which come up because people are sitting together and are talking together. And I think that is really the hope I have. Are there more questions? Yes? Thank you very much for a very nice mm. introduction. Uh, I saw you when you were visiting me. Uh, I saw it in, in, in the CEO of uh, Amazon and the CEO of Netflix. And their business model is to tell anything to everybody all over the world. <laughs> you have any comments? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um. uh, so the CEO uh, of Amazon said that our business model is selling everything to, every, uh, to anyone all over the world. Correct? Yeah, okay. yeah. Do you want um, to go ahead? Yeah, yeah I, I may jump on it and, and say that all the big companies, they have this goal of ruling or of, of helping you. That is what Google says. We are not, you know, possessing you. We are just giving you help to organize your life better, <laughs> to save energy in your home, uh, buy nest, to uh, find the way to this place here or any of the other services. And I really think that is the question of then, what are the costs of privacy data? And how can we take these privacy data back into our cities, into our companies? I mean, here in Norway, we have this case of the Norwegian shelf where we uh, ensure that the data are staying here. And uh, hopefully the case with um, IBM, mm. uh, IBM Watson on the shelf, where I would say it's better to invite IBM, sell us Watson, and let Watson do the job with our data in Norway on our shelf, and then analyze them and keep the profit within Norway. I think another point in, re in response to your question mm. Um, is about, and maybe this is a very conservative point, but I'm concerned about small business. <laughs> I'm concerned that in a community, people are able to start a business, live in the community, uh, make a living, provide services and goods to the local community. And I feel that this monopolistic model that Amazon has of wanting to be able to sell everything to everybody everywhere um, is antithetical to that, and and you know maybe it's maybe it's sentimental, but um, ultimately these kinds of questions come down to how we imagine the good life, to how we imagine what our communities and societies should be, and and to me an important part of that is you know the local grocery mm -hmm. store, uh, is the small business, and and I think that uh, if we let go of that, 
by allowing these monopolies to uh, to run everything and you know deliver our groceries on drones or whatever it is that Amazon's planning to do, um, I think we've lost something. Yeah. There's a question there. Yeah. Another question about corporations. Um, you mentioned that you know the the, the fact that corporations are are legal uh, people persons. Um, the corporations is, is also a very efficient way of raising capital uh, without uh, relying on credit. Uh, so have you, have you any ideas about how a capitalist system without uh, the corporation would look like? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, there's no uh, question in my mind that the, the reason why the corporation originated as it did was um, as a financing vehicle uh, where you don't have to go to the bank for credit, but you go out to millions or hundreds of millions of shareholders who will each give you five bucks or ten bucks or a hundred bucks, and you raise the large pools of capital that enable you to build the factories, the railroads, and the steamship lines that are now possible after the invention of the steam engine. That's why we got the corporation. It is a financing vehicle. And that's why we have to turn it into a person, because we need to protect all of these anonymous shareholders who have no involvement in running the company from liability for when things go bottom up in the company. So we say to them, look, if you put 10 bucks in, the most you'll be liable for is 10 bucks. We're going to limit your liability. But if we're going to limit the shareholders' liability, somebody has to be liable. Who is that? We magically create the corporate person. And the corporate person becomes the holder of the rights and liability of this collectivity of shareholders so they can be protected from being liable. And it is an absolutely brilliant system for raising massive amounts of capital. So there are two answers to your question. One is, if we continue along the lines of a large industrial global economy like we are, we need the corporation. If we're going to have a capitalist economy that operates on a large scale, I don't think we can do it by just relying on credit from banks. I think we need to be, entrepreneurs need to be able to say, I'm going to go public with this and I'm going to thereby get access to millions of small creditors, in effect. It's crowdsourcing, that's what a corporation does. Um, and, and so big capitalism needs the big corporation, there's no question. So then the question is, where are we, where do we need to go as a society? Do we need to abandon big capitalism? Is its model of endless growth, of concentration of wealth and power, of endless using up of the environment, of endless um, disregard for the fate of workers and communities, is that really the model for our future? Or should we go back to some kind of more small scale, still market-based economy, um, of more local, uh, more local capitalism, more local economic activity, which, is, which takes us back to Adam Smith. It was the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker that Adam Smith was talking about. He envisioned capitalism on a small scale. But as soon as the steam engine was invented, which was around the time he was writing The Wealth of Nations, all of that changed because now, which I don't think he could have necessarily foreseen, now you had projects that required large pools of capital. So to me, I mean, that is, that's the $64,000 question of do we continue to move forward with large capitalism, which needs large corporations, or are we going to evolve into something that's more radically sustainable and democratic? Mm. Joseph, uh, you wanted to answer that. Uh, and please be brief, because then we have room for one yes. more question. <laughs> one of the reasons why we built the Basic Internet Foundation was that we looked around and said that if we bring information out for everyone for free, then we will certainly be bought by one of the big guys. We don't want to be bought. We want to remain as a foundation. And uh, the examples here has, has for me been Egmont, who has taken over TV2. Mm -hmm. And uh, TV2 still lives quite a good life. So having a foundation in the button doesn't really destroy your business. And my other example is Huawei, who is uh, mainly owned by all of the people working there. These are two examples on the very extreme, one big, big telecommunication company and the foundations. And I think that is the model which might work for certain sectors in the economy. Good. Okay, you have the microphone. So uh, ask your question and then 
There's one more down here, so I promised him to get the question too, and then you can answer both of them. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, our ex experts and also professors, the wonderful uh, debates. And actually, I'm uh, from the Eastern world, I'm from China, and uh, I have something to say about China uh, doing like uh, something in Africa. And the many my classmates actually, he went to Africa, find the huge, enormous Chinese companies, and said, "Your Chinese are really everywhere." And uh, actually, for African friends, we because we experienced a really poor uh, experience, like period in history, where invaded by other countries, but uh, we really experienced this poor period. And we know how hard it is to have that kind of life to start up. And for African, I think it's like more win-win situation. And this I discussed with my Afri African friend, and she agreed about that. And uh, I think all the treatment and agreement is under the legal agreements with local African government. And the for more, one more point is that uh, we never treat uh, African friends as people and sell them as slaves to <laughs> other continents. So that's one point I want to comment. Thank you. Thank you. The other Thank you. On uh, the we table. take the other questions uh, uh, question right now. Right. Okay. Then we <laughs> we make. To we make the. You can also vote this question yeah. or comment yeah. on them in your. I think very it happen brief co yeah, closing I, I, statements. I, I, I think okay. it happens very much because of co corporations. I think the path pathological drive for a, co a corporation mm -hmm. to make more money is good for development. And then, of course, we have to regulate this. And the reason why I'm strongly in favor of, of international trade agreements like TTIP is because capital is global and we have to deal with it in a different way than we did 50 years ago. But I believe in capitalism. I believe in cooperation. I think it developed. It brings us goods and services, and it, it makes my life easier. Uh, my answer to your question, it, it's an either-or question. It, should it be the state or should it be corporations? I think it should be the state. And the reason I think it should be the state is because the state creates corporations. The state gives corporations all of the rights that they have, so it's hard for me to imagine uh, having corporations running globalization, but moreover, the state is in a unique position to be able to balance the competing interests of corporate capital with other interests like social interests and the environment. I don't believe uh, corporations are constituted in such a way, and I think we agree we on that. We agree this. on that. We agree on that. Uh, corporations are not constituted in such a way they can do that. So if, if somebody is running globalization, I would want them to be able to strike that balance. Dude, okay, now you agree, so then the debate is nearly over. <laughs> oh, but, uh, except, except, of course, <laughs> except, of course, the, the small, uh, uh, the answer to Africa. I was last week on the Nordic African Business Summit, and uh, some of your colleagues explained the master plan for Africa. And it was really an impressive 20 year master plan for Africa. And I agree with you that uh, when it comes to structures, Nobody is as perfect as uh, China has been in Africa to implement rules, regulations, which actually make the, uh, the countries more peaceful and thus uh, en enhance the life or make the life of the people better. But there's a second story, and that is the selling out of the resources uh, of, of the country. And the third one is about uh, what we call the Western rights. When you talk about slavery, I think we take that over a beer. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I think uh, everybody can go and take uh, the rest of the questions over a beer or a wine or a cup of coffee or anything. Right. It's festival. Uh, you don't have to go home. <laughs> but okay. the debate Thank is you. over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs>